the word t-shirt strictly speaking is a misnomer why because interstitium per se as you can see a diagram there on my left hand side is a very small microscopic anatomic space bounded by the basement membranes of epithelial and endothelial cells so the inflammatory and the fibrotic process in the interstitial lung disease extends well beyond the interstitium into the alveolar space surrounding alveolar space sni bronchial lumen and bronchioles so the interstitial lung disease pathology is not restricted to in strict terms of interstitium it extends well beyond it that is why we are calling it in strict sense it's not uh, it's a misnomer but having said that even then they are grouped into this term of interstitial lung disease why although they are heterogeneous and they have acute phases as well as chronic phases but they are classified together because they share the similar clinical radiologic physiologic or pathological manifestations in order to diagnose the interstitial lung disease it's multifactorial multidisciplinary multidimensional we need a clinical aspect number 1 the box on my left hand side here you can see always obviously the history is the first thing examination then some laboratory tests and apart from laboratory is the pft pulmonary function test apart from these things the other major component is radiology which is starting with the chest x ray and to the hrct which stands for high resolution ct scan so this is basically uh, the radiological aspect which is a very very important and integral aspect in the diagnosis of ild and lastly obviously the histopathology in particular the surgical lung biopsy specimens done by bronchoscopy or by surgical techniques so all these blue boxes leads to primary care physician where the patients uh, start referring to the pulmonologist pulmonologist uh, discussing with the radiologist and the pathologist so that's why i'm saying it's a multidimensional and multidisciplinary this slide is very very important this slide is basically telling you the huge pandora box of the different diseases which are come under the umbrella of ild so starting from here interstitial lung disease broadly divided into two groups number 1 where the etiology is known number second where the etiology is unknown the two broad categories then coming on my left hand side the where the etiology is known this is further divided into 1 2 3 four and five these groups starting with here where the etiology is known in organic exposure in organic substances exposure to these substances leading to interstitial lung disease they can be asbestos silica hard metals coal dust second major group is organic exposure exposure to organic substances like bird Okay, most bacteria, smoking exposure leading to DIP is disquamative interstitial pneumonia, respiratory bronchiolitis associated ILD, or pulmonary Langerhans dysteocytosis (LCH). Drugs: nitrofurantoin, amidron, methotrexate, chemotherapy, connective tissue growth, rheumatoid arthritis (RA), polymyositis, dermatomyositis, scleroderma, Sjogren. SLE etc so <clears throat> this was the major group where the etiology is known when we know the etiology but there is a large group where the etiology is not known and here basically you look for the the main group we call this iip 
the IIP is idiopathic interstitial pneumonia. This IIP is broadly divided into two main forms. IPF, which stands for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and non-IPF. This distinction is very important because it has pathophysiological and treatment discrimination. This distinction, as I've told, is IIP. Sometimes people, when call ILD, they are referring to this group of the disorders, which is IIP, and they forget about the rest. So this is also uh, I, important to know that when we say ILD is a very big term, which encompasses a lot of diseases underneath it. So coming back to where the interstitial lung disease the group where the etiology is not known, the major is IIP. The IIP is further divided into IPF and non-IPF. The non-IPF has got certain NSIP, non-specific interstitial pneumonia, COP, cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia, like this. And the other one are basically the another group where the etiology is unknown. They are relatively very rare, like LAMP, lymphangioleomyomatosis and vasculitis. Granulitis disease such as sarcoidosis, which is a relatively very well-known entity. Now coming back, how a person, a patient should be evaluated when we, for, for diagnosing interstitial lung disease? Number one, there should be the index of suspicion that a person is having ILD by the clinician. And that will start with history, examination, doing some laboratory tests, doing some radiology, doing some pulmonary function test, pulmonary provalcular lavage, sometimes a lung biopsy also at times is required. So what is the clinician's index of suspicion when the clinic Clinician becomes alert or starts suspecting a person. These are the few symptoms or things. Sometimes they come with symptoms of exertional dyspnea. Persistent non-productive cough. And sometimes they come with the x-ray in their hands and saying, this is the x-ray and I have been asked to see you. Why? Because there are bilateral diffuse interstitial infiltrates on the chest x-ray. And at times, they have a report of the spirometry or pulmonary function test showing the restrictive lung defect on the spirometry. So at times, they have symptoms. At times, they have some radiological abnormalities. And at times, they are having the spirometry report. And they, in this fashion, they come to us. So we take one by one. This is very important. Is the history. In history, what things we will look for? We look for age, gender, duration, past history, smoking, family, drug, occupational, environment. We take one by one. Age. So if there is age more than 50 years and person having those symptoms, we start suspecting person may have IPF, which is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. If he or she is a younger age between 20 to 40 years, then sarcoidosis and the ILD, which is associated with connective tissue disorders, comes into the differential. Now the gender bias. Yes, certain disease more common in women as compared to men. For example, women. LAM. LAM is a rare disease. As I have shown you, it's etiology unknown. Remember the first slide the, the, of the classification. So LAM is lymphangioleomyomatosis, a relatively rare one. But it's more common or exclusively, I would say, present in women of fertile age. Then ILD with connective tissue disorders, more common connective tissue disorders in women as compared to men. Then in men, obviously they go in the factories more commonly and they have some more exposure, occupational exposures, pneumoconiosis, and RA is one of the connective tissue related disorders, but is relatively more common in men as compared to women. The rest like Chagrin, like SLE, like uh, scleroderma, they are more common in them. As I have already told you that ILD can have an acute phase and can have a chronic phase. 
every ILD can have like this. So if by that in the history, acute presentation, that means we are talking of days to weeks, do we start suspecting persons having allergy to drugs, fungus, helminths, the worms, the parasites, acute idiopathic interstitial pneumonia, eosinophilic pneumonia, or hypersensitive pneumonitis. And in this presentation, when there is acute, generally ILDs have a chronic presentation. But few of them, as I mentioned, all of these, they may present acutely. So in this fashion, they may be confused, I'm written in the green one, that they may be confused with pneumonias. And which pneumonias? The atypical ones, or microorganisms having atypical pneumonias, causing atypical. In that fashion, we have to differentiate the person. First, we have to exclude that they should be not be having any infection when there is an acute presentation. Okay? Then there is another term, we call it subacute presentation. And this is from weeks to months. And this may occur in all, any of the ILD. Sarcoidosis, for example, drug-induced ILDs, alveolar hemorrhage syndromes, lupus pneumonitis. Chronic presentation, and this is the usual scenario most of the time is months to years. And the hallmark, the pathognomonic is IPF, that is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Sarcoidosis, PLCH, pulmonary Langerhans cell histiocytosis, pneumoconiosis, connective tissue disorders. Sometimes the patient says, if I'm all right and become unwell and then become all right again. So this is shows there is episodic nature. And these ILDs will think of when they have the episodic presentations, eosinophilic pneumonia, hypersensitive pneumonitis, cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, vascular disease, pulmonary hemorrhage. These are the few examples to it. Coming back to another very important aspect of history is past history. So what questions should be asked when we are suspecting is there any prior diagnosis of connective tissue disorder? A person may come up, is having the SLE for the past two years, and now is having shortness of breath. So we will start suspecting connective tissue associated ILDs in these fashion. Parasitic infections, travel history, HIV. In HIV, the LIP is more common. If you have a clinic along with chest with kidney disease, we think of pulmorenal syndromes like vasculitis, pulmonary renal syndrome, or connective tissue disorders. If with lung, with liver disease, we can think of sarcoidosis, we can think of pulmonary biliary cirrhosis. And if there is a facial paralysis and this, we can start suspecting sarcoidosis, but that can affect both things. Never the important aspect of uh, heredity transmission. Few of them, but they are very pretty rare, but just for the sake of completeness, I'm mentioning it, the names. That autosomal dominant disease is sometimes tuberous sclerosis, neurofibromatosis, and autosomal recessive is neiman peck disease and hermansky Pridlak syndrome. You need not to memorize them, but it's just for the sake of completeness, I'm mentioning this. Smoking is still very important. Uh, we can ask this question. For example, uh, which ILDs are associated with smoking? We can make a MCQ, a PCQ to it, and very easily can be made from this that PLCH, DIP, good pasture, respiratory bronchiolitis, pulmonary alveolar proteinosis. Okay, so each of these, which I've been showing you very easily, uh, PCQ, MCQ can be made. Drug history is a long list. I'm not here to uh, tell every long list, but just to mention the broad groups, certain antibiotics, Antirhythmics, anti inflammatory, neurological, sometimes the drug abuse like cocaine, heroin, they can also have chemotherapy, long list, which can affect the lungs. Bilomycin, for example, commonly been referred to us from the hematology, oncology, you know. And, you know so there are a lot of huge list. Occupation, again, very important. Sometimes electrician, plumber, Pipe fitter, construction worker, 
shipbuilder. These are the professions. Whenever any of these are present, we start suspecting person may have a pneumoconiosis, which is asbestosis type of ILD. And this belongs to the one the etiology is known. Remember the slide, the two broad categories and the exposure is asbestos, the material is. For example, stone cutter, miner, sand blaster, glass make, they make the glass, they make the bulb, for example, silicosis, crystalline silica dust, for example. Metal grinder, giant cell interstitial pneumonia, hard metal lung disease, so they have exposure to cobalt, tungsten, carbide, metal worker, berylosis, beryllium exposure, factory worker, nuclear weapons, aircraft, electronics, ceramics, golf club, bicycle frames, they all can have, can have berylosis or beryllium exposure. Coal worker, coal workers, pneumoconiosis, the exposure is of coal dust, paint sprayer, paint worker, isocyanides, birds breeder, birds. Breeders are dropping the bird feathers exposure, farm worker, haying mushroom, farmer's lung, mushroom worm, worker's lung, office worker, humidifier, lung, ventilation, pneumonitis, lifeguard, hot tub, hypersensitivity, pneumonitis, where the exposure is to microbia, atypical in particular. The occupational and environmental history is an integral component of the history when we are suspecting a person with the ILD and strict chronological listing of lifelong employment and exposure should be asked. I, I, I was doing, I was working in a factory, yes, but what were you doing before that? You say, oh, I was working in a coal mine before that, for example. So every detail, not one history is enough. You take the full detail history of the employment and then you ask the very important cysts whenever that do the symptoms diminish or disappear on leaving the site and reappear on returning. This is a very important question, a lot of things. And the example is hypersensitivity pneumonitis because that's showing the temporal relationship to, uh, to a certain exposure. For example, a person who has a hobby of pigeon breeder. So there's a temporal relationship of or to the workplace like farmers lung. So person, for example, when they are off the off the factory, when they are on weekends, for example, they say we feel better, but when we start the work, we become bad. So, I mean, this is showing some kind of temporal relationship between the, the occupation and the exposure. So what do we look for? After taking a good history detail, we come to the examination and symptoms and signs of examination. So dyspnea is a very important uh, symptom and a sign as well at times. So common and pro prominent complaint. Along with the discussing the, the x-ray along with the examination as well. Sometimes we see a person who is complaining of dyspnea, right? But the x-ray is not according to the symptoms. What I'm trying to say is that X-ray is worse. X-ray is, sorry, X-ray is relatively better or patient is worse. And sometimes the other way around, like the person is saying, I'm Disney, I'm Disney, I have a lot of symptoms, is complaining or he or she is complaining, he is having dyspnea, is having shortness of breath. But when we look at the chest X-ray, there isn't anything. So I'm discussing here now, if without significant dyspnea, and sometimes the dyspnea is not there, but the X-ray is worse. So patient is better, but the X-ray is worse. So what are the differentials? We ask this in Viva also at times, and I think you can also be made that the symptoms are less, or dyspnea is less or negligible, but the X-ray is very worse. What are the causes? So these are sarcoidosis, the hallmark disease. The long list of sarcoidosis is the main thing, if you can remember. ILD, as you know, does not have usually the wheezing on examination. They usually have crackles. Wheezing is more associated with obstructive airway disease, like COPD. In my first lecture, a couple of days back, for example, 
or with asthma, with this wheezing. But ILD, but sometimes in some of the ILD, yes, wheezing. So what are those? This is also an MCQ, simple that chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, shark straw syndrome, respiratory bronchitis, sarcoidosis. Chest pain is again an uncommon symptom with the ILDs. At times we have bleeding, blood in the sputum, which may be streaked or may be frank hemoptysis. It's a rare pre presenting manifestation, but at times when there's diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, one can have it. In lamb also in tuberous cyclorosis and in another very important group of vasculitis. So if you can remember vasculitis and alveolar hemorrhage, Velcro characters, these are the very important uh, crackles and what are these velcro you know is type of a sticking thing we have on our purses or bags handbags where that sound when you open it up the bag so it is that crunching crunching sound sort of this is the being linked to the velcro and what are those they are the end inspiratory dry uh, crackles predominantly basilar at times you hear the squeaks as well and this is generally with the airway centered pathology like hypersensitivity pneumonitis clubbing very very important finger club certain ILDs present with clubbing and uh, the major ones are ipf that is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis asbestosis chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis and desquamative interstitial pneumonia. So these are the four main causes of clubbing uh, in a patient which is having the ILDs. At times we have signs of pulmonary hypertension, advanced stages due to progressive interstitial fibrosis and hypoxemia. The manifestation is loud P2, fan systolic murmur of tricuspid regurgitation, right-sided S3 and elevated JVP, the jugular venous pressure. So what laboratory, after making a history, after doing an examination, detailed thing, what laboratory should be asked for? So all patients with suspected ILD should have a complete blood count, should have a liver function test, should be checked for blood urea nitrogen and the creatinine. So liver functions, bun and creatinine, the kidney function, and CBC is the general hematology. If there is any history of muscle pain and weakness, you start doing the aldolase, creatinine kinase, and JO1 antibody. If there is a suspicion of vasculitis, you check the urinary sediment, that means urine DR, for example, and you send the NCA labels, which is CNCA as well as PNCA, depending on what you are suspecting. Suspected connective tissue, you start with autoimmune checking, let ANA, anti-nuclear antibodies, RF, promotide factor, anti-double-stranded DNA, and the ENA, profile. So these are the tests according to what you are suspecting. Then you test accordingly. Huge list, but just to mention it that ANA is associated with SLE, for example, scleroderma, SSA, which Synthetase, scleroderma is anti SCL70, rheumatoid with RF factors, anti CCP, mixed connected with RMP, and vasculitis with PNC and CNK. Another integral component of the diagnosis is the radiology. Very, very important. Lot of new research, new status. The importance of radiology is increased a lot. So I'm showing in this slide the algorithm for optimal diagnostic use of chest x-ray. When there is, so whenever the test you ask these questions here on chest x-ray, lung shedding is present and is it diffuse? So if diffuse lung shedding present, okay, what is the radiological pattern? Is this reticular pattern you're seeing? It's a nodular pattern, it's an alveolar component or what? Then if you see the distribution of the diffuse lung disease, which zones? It is upper zone or lower zone. Three zones, chest x-ray is divided arbitrarily, not in reality. 
or its central or its peripheral. So all the abnormality we are seeing on the chest X-ray is it mainly central or it's present in the periphery close to the pleura or is close to the mediastinum, close to the heart, close to the mediastinum, like this. Or it's present in the apex of the lung or the middle part where the hilum are there or it's close to the diaphragm. That is what the zones are, upper, middle and lower in general. The division is according to the ribs. Okay. Then do you look for ancillary radiographic signs? Whether along with this there is pleural disease present or not, there are any lymph nodes enlargement present or not, okay. or the clinical information has to be linked with all these X-ray findings. So this is I'm talking on chest X-ray alone. Now we come to this now. So we have done a chest X-ray now. There is a diffuse lung disease that is for sure on chest X-ray, and I've told you we have to look for which zone the main abnormality is restricted or confined or it's more depicted to which zone of the lung? Lower zone, middle zone, or upper zone? As the name suggests, right? So if the abnormalities are in the lower zone, think of IPF, think of asbestosis, think of fibrotic and SIP, or NICP with connective tissue. But do you always rule out or always consider cardiac failure? The cardiac failure may have lower zone abnormalities. So you have to exclude this cardiac failure because this is has to be excluded. If the abnormality on the chest X-ray is predominantly mid to upper zones, you think of granulomatous disease like sarcoidosis, like TB or post-TB fibrosis or HP, hypersensory pneumonitis. If there are major uh, mediastinal lymphadenopathy, it's more than three centimeters, you start suspecting and they are symmetrical in particular. So you say it's sarcoidosis, bilateral, symmetrical, but you always consider TB, lymphoma, and other malignancies. TB is usually unilateral, but maybe sometimes this. So you consider this. If you have a mass-like lesions, think of sarcoidosis, think of cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, but always rule out lymphoma and other malignancies if you have mass-like lesions. See, ILD, as the name suggests, is interstitial lung disease. Generally, the lungs in general terms are small. In asthma and COPD, the lungs are big. An obstructive airway disease, the lungs are large. In restrictive lung dis disorders like ILD, the lungs are small. But sometimes, very few, uh, even with ILD, the lungs are big. So what are those causes? So these are Langerhans cell histiocytosis, cystic lung disease is the broad group. Or you simply, two diseases occurring together. For example, a person is having ILD, pulmonary fibrosis, but is, was an ex-smoker, having emphysema. Emphysema leads to big lungs. Fibrosis leads to small lungs. Whichever is uh, more dominant will lead to that thing. Dominant will lead to more. If fibrosis is dominant, it lead to more small lungs. So like this. So ILD in association with plural, plural disease. Sometimes the ILD does not usually have pleura, plural involvement. Plural disease means plural fusion, pneumothorax. These are two main things in pleura. So you think of asbestosis, you think of connective tissue, but you always rule out malignancy, mesothelioma in particular. Right? The reactivation of TB can be present with ILD with plural disease as well. And as I've already told you, episodic presentation, we call it evanescent, of fleeting, of waxing and waning, multifocal concern. Waxing and waning sometimes in, for example, four months back, he had a consolidation or obesity consolidation on x-ray on the right side and two months back he has on the left side and the right side has gone. So it's vexing and waning. But these are the immunologically mediated disorders. You think, start suspecting immunologically mediated like cryptogenic organizing pneumonia like ABPA, the allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, which is the allergic reaction to aspergillus. 
at times we have fixed multifocal cuts. Fixed means they are not evanescent. They are not waxing and waning. They are fixed. Two months before, this is also on the right side, uh, mid zone. And two months after, also on the right side, mid zone. Is malignancy and RA. Septal thickening, thickening, infection, pulmonary edema, for example, you have to rule out, check for malignancy, pulmonary vein occlusive disease, rarely. Cystic changes, you already eosinophilic granuloma, lamb, mosaic, is there a trapping, the constrictive bronchiolitis. This slide is just showing you the different shadowing of the interstitial lung patterns, in particular linear, like this. See, reticular, reticular with honeycombing, the cystic spaces, nodular, nodules, reticular, nodular, they have this pattern plus this pattern both mixed together. They so have reticular, nodular. Coming back to the, the major hallmark of the disease are the features for the UIP, we call that <coughs> the pattern. This pattern coming, we are now restricting to idiopathic interstitial pneumonia, which is one of the classification, if you recall, we divided ILD into etiology known, unknown. Among the unknown, the major group was IIP, the idiopathic interstitial pneumonia. Among them were further divided into IPF and non-IPF. So you call the usual interstitial pneumonia, we call it here. This is the term. Frequency is 50%. HRCT is honeycombing is the hallmark. The syndrome which is associated with this UIP is IPF. But we call this IPF only idiopathic when we rule out the connective tissue, these disorders. Otherwise, it can be associated with this pattern as well. So we call it IPF only when we have UIP pattern, but we do not have the, the any underlying known cause here. So this slide is just telling you the different uh, how to diagnose basically UIP or coming to back to one is the radiological UIP, probable UIP, indeterminate and alternative. So in UIP, the main thing is subpleural and basal predominance and with honeycombing. This if you can uh, remember is okay. And the alternative is the totally out from here which has got cysts, predominant nodules, masses, which will be alternative. We will not think of UIP here then. These are the abbreviations used in the previous slide. Now this is I'm showing you the subplural nature. I told you when we look for the radiology, we look for the where the predominant pathology is. This pathology is C, here is just close to the pleura, not close to the center, it's close to the periphery. All of this, this is subplural. This is cystic spaces. As I told you earlier, this is cystic spaces like honeycombing. There is some ground glass, but there is septal thickening here. This is septal thickening here. But there's much of the subplural cysts here, which is subplural means just below the pleura. Here you can see here the septal thickening, here the cyst. Blue arrow showing the septal, and here showing the honeycombing. This is very typical for. UIP pattern. This is the usual interstitial pneumonia pattern. So what is the diagnostic criteria for IPF is the exclusion of the other known causes of ILD as I've already told you. Connective tissue drug toxicity plus either number one, the presence of HRCT pattern of UIP or either this with this or if this is not present then you do the other combination of the pattern with the biopsy septic. Management of IPF, generally, currently, there is no role of uh, in stable outpatient clinics, treatment of steroids, azathioprine is aminosuppressive, and acetylcysteine is a mycolytic in the treatment of IPF. Yes, with any acute exacerbation, steroids can be used. Same is true for the IPF as well. But the major classical drug which we ask in IPF treatment, you need to, if you can remember the name, is perfinidone or nenitanib. 
these two are the therapeutic agents which we use in ipf so generally in stable ipf patients over the in the clinics we don't recommend any more prednisolone aminosuppressors in general coming back to the another very important group of uh, ild sarcoidosis the sarcoidosis as you recall is again one of the ild where the etiology was unknown and it is in the unknown factor mainly granular metastasis sarcoid nodules are the classical presentation with peri lymphatic distribution peri bronchovascular may present with consolidation may have an airway disease may present with fibrosis another important presentation is with lymphadenopathy generally the lymphadenopathy of a sarcoidosis is uh, symmetrical symmetrical meaning having both sides right and left but there are other differentials as men amyloidosis pneumoconiosis but really 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 it's uh, sometimes very rarely the symmetric lymphadenopathy can have lymphoma and mycobacterial infection so generally lymphoma and tb for example does not have symmetrical lymphadenopathy that means they have asymmetrical they either affect the right hilum or they affect the left side for example uh, but not both together generally this is just to tell you about the radiological uh, staging on chest x ray mainly staging on plain radiographs stage 0 when no venom abnormality 10% of the cases stage 1 is hilar or mediastinal not associated with visible lung disease about majority 50% of the cases means lymph node hilar plus no enlargement not associated with lung disease only the mediastinal and say stage 2 hilar with lung disease so you have hilar lymph node enlargement with visible lung disease this is about 30% of the cases then stage 3 diffuse lung disease without lymph node enlargement 10% of the cases stage 4 is sometimes referred to as end stage fibrosis please do remember that these stages 0 1 2 3 4 is not according to the severity of the sarcoidosis it's just the manifestation so it does not reflect the severity all the time it's this is the same thing we are showing uh, in a picture that see here this is the mediastinal lymph node 75% here hilar on the right side this is the right lung this is the left lung this is the center 75% hilar and then is 95% here is known as 1 2 3 sign or we sometimes make a victory stand this is the first position this is the second position this is a victory stand where the person uh, gets the medal the gold medal the the silver and the bronze like this or you call it one two three sign as well on the chest x ray very classical for sarcoidosis you having this group of lymph nodes in large which is mediastinal paratracheal paratracheal right paratracheal right hilar and the left hilar this is one two three same is on the lateral aspect okay treatment of cortical uh, the sarcoidosis it with steroids but only when the persons are dyspneic or symptomatic pulmonary sarcoidosis i'm talking about because sarcoid can affect cns as well and almost any organ of the body but we are talking about pulmonary sarcoidosis so you have to do lung function testing and showing if there is any deterioration or there is a low values then we go for the steroid treatment thank you very much hello hello uh, ravi sir ji sir i have completed the lecture okay students uh, sir have finished the lecture so you can ask question on chat box and also voice so can you student yes. having the question so please uh, i mean uh, what i have to do as uh, sir ravi yes sir a student will ask question on the chat box and also raise their hand so we can start qa for just 10 minutes and then okay. we finished it okay i am here okay students chat is enable for everyone so you can ask question
to sir directly uh, how to look for it what what should i do i i'm not seeing uh, anything yes sir, uh, there's a more option in your screen more button yeah more option yes and chat is there yes yes sir you can you tell me what to do yeah more i have opened yes yes uh, so there, there's a chat box opened in your screen yeah chat yeah i uh, click it yes sir click it okay yes i have clicked it a uh, question by karsam that which book you study could you please uh, repeat why facial okay so i am answering to this question ki why facial nerve palsy is important in past history because facial nerve palsy if you are suspecting an ild and a person has a history of facial nerve palsy sarcoidosis is a disease is an ild which can have the facial nerve palsy that is why is asking the clues there are small clues which help us in making the reaching the right diagnosis okay which uh, what he say sir in pulmonology which things should be in focus so treatment uh, morphology uh, so everything has got his own part i mean uh, the this subject is i know this uh, interstitial lung disease is one of the most difficult uh topic in pulmonology and uh, it requires things beyond pulmonology as well we, because radiology is an integral component of pulmonology and pathology as well and then you, you take lung cancer for example so if you have not done the ct scan or if you not done the biopsy in particular you cannot diagnose lung cancer for example right you the uh, study is uh, all written in the classical textbooks like davidson uh, is a very classical book for medicine for your students of medicine and uh, i would recommend latest edition of uh, latest edition although the books textbooks always lag behind because 3 4 years and guidelines are very current and latest but still you get lot of good information from your uh, davidson medicine book what does consolidation on chest yes consolidation is a thing can represent infection most commonly consolidation is associated with the uh, infection but very rarely it can present with some new plastic lesions like bronco alveolar carcinoma now new name is invasive uh, alveolar in, in, invasive adenocarcinoma they can present with consolidation as well but whenever you see consolidation think of it infection in general kaplan syndrome is a, is a specific term there a lot of syndrome i don't want to bog you down with the, uh, the things it has got a lung masses on the chest x ray and there is a history of poll workers uh, pneumoconiosis along with this thing right it can have it but uh, yeah anything else any more questions uh i'm answering this question there will be an inclusion online after uh, i think this you need to ask from your uh, the, from your principal and they can guide you on that thing okay, thank you sir okay you're welcome any more questions so the chest x ray very very i mean the elementary things like which i have just mentioned the uh, okay i'll mention the first answer this question the x ray the main x ray is very chest x ray is very important thing it will help you in each and every specialty not restricted to pulmonology it's in medicine it is in surgery in pre op anesthesia people ask for chest x ray it is got a very versatile and lot of usages beyond the aspect of pulmonology for every specialty yeah i think chest x very important but you do the basics that's just the basics are very important abps stands for allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis as mentioned this is a term aspergillus aspergillus is a fungus fungus can manifest in three main things one is the allergic reaction one is the infection one is the saprophytic relationship the saprophytic relationship is with aspergilloma 
we call it fungus ball, for example. Simple words I'm talking, very simply trying to make it more simple. Where is the ABPA? Is the allergic component, allergic response to aspergillus. When there is a saprophytic relationship of aspergillus, aspergilloma. And for example, a person with old TB cavity, person had TB before and it got a cavity and in cavity, there is a ball there. Fungus ball, we call it aspergilloma. There is a saprophytic relationship. Second relationship I told you was the allergic. This is APP, allergic property aspergillus. They are fleeting and vexing shadowing with the IG level of mouse, for example, the peripheral xenophilia is present and the consistent with asthmatic patients or cystic fibrosis patients. So generally, the patient is having underlying asthma and the asthma typically present with uncontrolled asthma. Despite giving them adequate therapy, the asthma is not under. Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, ABP, I have just mentioned, mesothelioma is a plural uh, neoplastic lesion. Uh, so it's a neoplastic lesion, mainly affecting the pleura. And with asbestos exposure in particular. Next, please, Annie. You're welcome. Uh, uh, Ravi, yes, I think sir. if there are no more questions, then oh, okay, sir. We are.